hosted three PhD students at Leicester, Andrea, Elvira, and Helene, which was terrific, and they made a real contribution to, to the centre um, itself. Um, the subject of the talk, that I want to give a very brief talk, really, is about um, <coughs> institutions and urban history. Um, I think it will probably be a bit impudent to say that I'm building on the very elegant and sophisticated discussion of uh, Denis Bouquet a bit earlier. I, in my own sort of prosaic and what I'm learning to call Anglo-Saxon way, is I am um, wanting to look purely at three institutions. Uh, the Centre for Urban History itself, um, I want to look at the European Association for Urban History. And then finally, a, a much looser organisation in the UK called the Society for the Promotion of Urban Discussion, which is another kind of network that, that I'm involved with. And the theme, really, of the talk that I want to put over to you is the ways in which institutions and organisations shape knowledge and actually structure fields like urban history and planning history. And if you like, the histories of these institutions are also the histories of the subject. Um, I want to start then briefly by saying something about the uh, Centre for Urban History. Urban history as a subject in the UK really dates back to the 1970s. The first, um, the first uh, professor of urban history in the United Kingdom was uh, Jim Dias in 1970. Um, and the journal Urban History that I'm co-editor of was also started in the early 1970s. The centre is actually a later edition and set up not by Dias, but by Peter Clark, who I believe was with you um, last year, in 1985, so we're 35 years old. The centre itself is a centre for research and postgraduate training, and we specialise in histories of Britain, of Ireland, to an extent of Europe, but less than we might do, I guess, but also China and India, which are important elements, especially in the sort of new set of urban history that's developed in the last five years or so, ten years. Um, we run <coughs> seminars and workshops, we run an awful lot of them, and many of you will have attended one or other, like uh, the uh, Global Urban History Conference last July. We run a journal, as I say, now with Cambridge University Press, we run a journal from the centre. Um, and we have lots of visiting scholars from China, uh, from Europe, and so on. We're very well networked with other institutions in the urban history firmament, like the important centre at Antwerp, uh, at Aarhus in Denmark, uh, Amsterdam, also in Shanghai, the Centre for Global, uh, global Urban Cultures. <coughs> um, what I want to suggest to you also is that a good thing to ask about any individual or any organisation is what's their driving intellectual question. What is it, what, what problematic, as it were, are they attempting to get at? And it's always difficult if you reflect back at your own institution or yourself, indeed, and think about what is it that's been driving this institution or, or these people all this time. And I want to pose that question to each of the three organisations, as it were, that I'm looking at here. But I think the key, the key question for the Centre for Urban History, over actually several decades now, has been the question of what's, what's called the urban variable. What difference, what difference do cities make in historical processes? What, what is it that is urban about those processes? What is to be 
like is the cityness, if I can say that. What is the cityness of the city? And I think I can talk about that a bit more later, but I think that's the, the sort of key question that has animated many of our discussions uh, over the years in the Centre for Urban History. We're going to move now quickly to my second institution, which almost all of you will know, I hope, which is the European Association for Urban History. Founded in 1989 and with the first conference in 1992. There the big conferences all around Europe. Rome was the last one in 2018, then previous to that Helsinki and Lisbon and so on. The next conference, you might be interested to know, is going to be in Australia in 2022. Um, the conference is a very large conference. It gets about uh, 700 delegates. I think actually there were 800 in uh, Rome. One of the things that I think is important to remember about EAUH is that in its inception, it was born out of very particular networks, particular European networks of urbanism. But some of the characteristics of them, I think, explain partly why the conference is like it is. One is the emphasis on the medieval and the early modern. The 20th century was not really, didn't loom large in the early thinking of the, um, of the EAUH. Um, it was also dominated, I would say, by certain, uh, certain countries, if you like. France, uh, Netherlands, Belgium, UK. So it's a kind of North European focus to it from, from its inception. And I think it also shares with another uh, Dutch conference, the European Social Science History Conference, many of the same concerns. These are actually both conferences is an interesting phenomenon. Conferences that grew in the 1990s into sort of mega events, mega festivals of particular forms of history. Uh, the uh, European, European Social Science History Conference gets about 1,500 people. So these are really quite big um, events. And the third kind of themes recur, I think, in, in EAUH, and actually they're shared, as I say, with the Social Science History Conference. Migration is one major theme that is always represented there. Migration in cities. Urban elites and urban governance is a standard topic as well. Urban space, memory, memorialization, heritage. Those are all themes that you see well represented within the um, the European Association for Urban History Conferences. The next conference is going to be in 2020. Many of you will be participating. Um, it's going to be at Antwerp. The theme is Cities in Motion. Now, I think this its quite an interesting theme. I suspect that it reflects the mobility term in the social sciences of the early 2000s to some extent. It also reflects concerns with migration again and flows of people and the role of migration as a dynamic for cities. Um, it's interested in concepts of flow and it also interestingly puts onto the agenda transport history, something which I think got lost which was a sort of subset of economic history in the 1970s and kind of got sidelined, got parked somewhere and is just, as it were, undergoing now a, um, a, a, a kind of renaissance in a way. So what's the question then that animates EAUH? I don't know, actually. I'm not <laughs> sure what the answer to that is. But what I think it is is a kind of liberal project of a certain kind. And I mean that in the sense that it's a kind of pluralistic space. 
with all the pros and cons of that. Um, and one of, the, one of the cons, if you like, is that you tend to get segmentation. It segments the subject. There's no space at which urban history, planning history, anything else can come together within that. So in a way, it's a kind of festival of cities, of the history of cities, but it doesn't have uh, a, a rationale beyond itself, as it were. Finally, in this, I want just to talk about something very different, which is a, a, another group that I run, uh, called the Society for Promotion of Urban Discussion, we call it SPUD, but of course that is a play on the Society for the Promotion of Urban Renewal, which was an important society of the late 1950s, in which Peter Hall was a, a leading uh, leader. Uh, formed quite recently, it's a very loose organisation, you could call it an anti-institution if you want to. It's something that people, there's no membership, uh, people come and go as they want. Um, it has no, it has no outputs, the outputs of the discussion that happen at the meetings. It meets three times a year. It's non-instrumental, you're not, other than ideas, other than not, you're not going to get anything out of it. There's no money. Uh, its aim, specific aim, is to promote dialogue between forms of history that don't speak, speak to one another generally. Architectural history, social history, urban history, and in a sense, planning history, too. And these are designed to form around the particular processes that have shaped the history of Britain in this case, um, but of course shape many other places as well, in the second half of the 20th century really. So there are, there are really four processes that we, we attend to. Welfare, the creation of welfare states, uh, planning, which of course in a sense intersects also with welfare and welfareism in the context of the second half of the 20th century. Decolonization, particularly important in Britain, and thinking about the creation of multicultural cities from the 1970s onwards, and deindustrialization as the fourth major historical process running through this. And part of our purpose is to think about how these larger historical processes intersect, and how they intersect particularly in cities. Uh, I think there's, there's another agenda that runs quite strongly through this, which is an agenda that's affecting British history quite strongly as a whole at the moment, which is an obsession with the shift from social democracy in the post-war period to a kind of market liberalism, from a social democratic state, what people, some people call a developmental state, to a neoliberal state. <coughs> with the cutoff point round, round about 1980. So what, are the, what are the features, as it were, of that social democratic city? And what then are the characteristics of a neoliberal city? And what is the relationship between these? What, what kind of historical explanation is that about the emergence of the neoliberal city in the late, uh, the late 20th century? And so in this, I think what's really interesting here is that urban history has actually suddenly gone from being an interesting marginal enterprise to something that is actually about rewriting the history, the political history of Britain in the later 20th century. So the, the book that I have the cover of on the right hand side by the American historian Guy Ortolano, Thatcher's Progress, is a history precisely of that movement from social democracy to market liberalism, but told through a history of Milton Keynes, a new town built in the late 1960s and 1970s as the sort of, of epitome of, of what Ottomano calls welfare modernism, but which in the course of the 1980s becomes a flag, flagship 
for Mrs. Thatcher's enterprise culture. Something very different. And indeed, the kind of blueprint for Milton Keynes is then exported around other parts of the world to North Africa, for example, to uh, Pakistan, and so on. So, those are three institutions. And what I want to stress through this is that institutions actually shape fields of knowledge, and they shape the field of knowledge or the fields of knowledge that we work in, in particular ways. This is why when you go to a particular meeting like this, you might think to yourself, oh, this is kind of strange, where does this come from? But thinking about that historical question, where does it come from? It comes from very particular places, very particular kinds of institutional and ideological matrices. What it also suggests to us is that this is not a unified field. There are very different traditions working here, radically different traditions. But I think the really good news is that there's no reason why any of us should be constrained by one of these traditions. We can move between these. We can learn things from all of them. So I think we can all enjoy a little bit of what I call history hopping. Thank you. Uh, I'll speak very briefly about the International Learning History Society, uh, where I was uh, president for four years now. Uh, we are a smaller group um, of about 400 members, and we have biannual conferences. The last one was uh, in Yokohama, and the next one will be in Moscow. And maybe you have been yesterday evening for the book presentation. Uh, the book uh, from Harald Kuhnschatz will be excellent when you join the camp friends in Moscow to understand Moscow and to have a very successful visit uh, to Moscow. Yes, uh, we also have a journal called uh, Planning Perspective, which was already mentioned this morning. And when you become a member of the Planning History Society, you get the journal for free, and I think it's a quite interesting journal. Yeah. But uh, I have uh, written uh, a small article for the uh, uh, History Newsletter, and uh, I hope you all have a subscription of this newsletter. So I'll not go too much into detail uh, about the society and the next conference and uh, all the prizes which are going to be awarded, the book prize and the prize for the best article and so on. I'll start here today uh, with some remarks on the geographical framework you want to discuss when I write uh, the abstract of this conference. And the question, uh, how to define Europe and what is European urbanism? Under the European label, under the European city label, monument conservationists are concerned with the preservation of older buildings, urban planners, with the compact city and possibilities for its reconstruction, humanities scholars, with the relationship between privacy and public rights, inclusion and exclusion, historians with history, traditions, and law duvets, and the geographers for structural types of cities, and finally, the layers of legal systems and legitimacy. Since the European city is extremely <coughs> diverse, a substantial and careful definition is difficult. Different cultures, religions, systems of rule, ethnic groups, economies, plans and projects have favored the development of different city personalities in Europe. Societal change has continually changed cities, creating traces, faults and overlaps to make up European cities today. Cities thus reflect the respective political, legal, and administrative 
circumstances as well as long-term historical processes. The term European city is used as an analytical category in relation to other city types and as a concept also for planning. There is no clear distinction between these two levels. The concept of European city includes morphological, social, historical, ethnic and cultural dimensions and at the analytical and at the model level. In German we use the term light build, which is not easy to translate. It is a kind of a statement, commitment, that includes a vision, a spatial model and often implicit societal perspectives. There is no clear distinction between these two levels. Some scholars are also suggesting a Europe of regions based on diverse histories and cultures. So for example, it takes a Basque country and Spain or uh, Castilian and uh, other regions. All European cities contain traditions, institutions and attributions of meaning for the citizens. The historical reference to the European city remains vague. It refers primarily to Central Europe, large <coughs> cities and refers to the presence of history in everyday life and the cityscape, but without concretizing the time window that serves as an orientation. Cities contain a persistence that includes transformation and metaphors. In the rather thoughtless use of the term European city, it implies an excess as well as the fear of loss and cultivates transfiguring backward move of social utopia which start from similarities and structural similarities without sufficiently reflecting relevant difference and diversity. Please, yes, is this a European city? Could be. <laughs> Could be. Okay. Could be.
The rediscovery and the reassessment of the past by ensuring the distinctive character of historical cityscapes reflects the changes in values and the search for tried and tested current goals. In response to the functionist urbanist planning reconstruction in the old style on the old floor plan with restorative urbanity was considered an appropriate model. But there are many models of the European city and there are many different planning cultures. And uh, the British uh, uh, geographer Andy Sonny has produced this model of European planning cultures and he defines four different types. He calls them families, the British family, the Napoleonic family, Scandinavian Dutch family, and the Germanic family. And you can see this is another way uh, how uh, to underline the importance of diverse uh, planning cultures here in Europe. The rediscovery of the qualities of the historic city, what is called the European urbanism, has led to a fundamentally different understanding what is considered the better city. The city of modernity, which was launched under the banner of structural and social process, not only lost its fascination, but it became a symbol of destruction, inhospitality, sobriety, and coldness. After the post-war, the flight to the suburbs was the guiding principle and the paradigm of the European city now includes mixed neighborhoods, conservation, small-scale, step-by-step approaches, interior development, dense, compact city structures. The city of short distances and participative processes of urban development. It is no coincidence that there is a reorientation of objectives that corresponds with the so-called renaissance of the city. The increase in attractiveness, gentrification, the influx, and upgrading of the city centers in those quarters next to the city centers. But the planners, disciplinary identity, professional authority, and vision challenge the disciplines self-image and indicates that follows and criticized by the principle of sorting out spatial functions and planners by thinking big using deductive reasoning. Planning was often ineffective, inefficient, unsuccessful, and despite of its visionary ambitions had contributed little to the recovery and visual enhancement of cities. As a planning goal, the European city found its way into mission statements and models without being explicitly defined. Mainly, reference is made to dense, compact, and mixed use structures and references to the city before World War I. This perspective refers to different structural and spatial backdrops, both to transformations in the existing structure and the improvement of large housing estates, as well to the conversion projects in new districts. Based on the criticism of guiding principles such as the functional zone city, this orientation towards the European city in the absence of more coherent concepts reflects a kind of lowest common denominator among city planners and politicians. The questions, can our cities survive, raised in the post-war reconstruction period, must be changed to a more positive perspective to the currently renaissance of the city. The European city model is intended to show orientations that planning, planning and politics can follow. Adaptability and resilience are characteristics that integrate new challenges 
include inventory and history and can combine continuity, continuity with flexibility. Not only is an urban design and structure of the final state intended, but process-based implementation and involvement of civil society groups are integral parts of the vision state. Similar values, consistent attitudes, mentalities and shared cultural heritage are further interior of the European city project. It was not for nothing that planning was called urban expansion in the 19th century. It was designed for to order of growth, expansion and growing cities. We are more about it in the last lecture before. But planning shrinkage is a task that has become more increasingly important in the last decades of the last uh, century. City shrinkage, on the other hand, is an unwanted process. It is an unplanned side effect and indirect result of political and economic decisions of deindustrialization and deregulation. Urban planning is reactive in the context of shrinkage and will increasingly have to use softer instruments but cannot influence the causes of shrinkage. Shrinking cities, cities also require a rethinking of the European city vision, which was imaginable only as a growing city for a long time. Cities have always been the subject of contradictionary perceptions that oscillate between admiration and euphoria, between criticism and rejection. The ideology of agricultural romanticism and hostility to the big city that emerged at the end of the 18th century, not just a European phenomenon, was embedded in social critical empirical studies of the big city problems, as well as cultural pessimistic currents that lamented the decomposition of the society. Max Weber has mentioned four characteristics, none of which in itself constitutes the specificity of the European city, but which, when combined, constitute the European city. Differentiation, emancipation, urban lifestyle, with polarity of public and private sphere, centrality, size and density, as well as interventions by the state. But the, what is called the so-called dark side of the consequences of planning should not be ignored. We heard yesterday evening uh, more about it. Both under the fascist regimes in Europe, in Germany, Italy, Spain, and Portugal, and in the Soviet Union, planning was associated with violence against peoples, with radical order, discipline, and racist population policy. Supposed so called final solution served as planning laboratory for radical spatial resettlement concepts. Furthermore, radical planning based in the Western model in the context of decolonization processes served as concept again backwardness and for catch up modernization. Leonie Sandekov connotes with modernist planning its anti democratic race and gender blind and often using cultural homogenizing practices. But there is no single definite approach for urban history and urban planning history, just like there is no current way of planning. Peter Hall has stated that, I quote, 20th century city planning is an intellectual and professional movement that was essentially a reaction to the evils of the 19th century city. So, some remarks uh, about planning history at the end. I think uh, what relates also 
part two uh, the discussions uh, for this morning. Uh, we should look in the future for more comparative transnational planning histories and cross-cultural approaches. There are network flows of ideas and too often it's just selective borrowing best practices, what they are called, not reflecting other historical and cultural contexts. The societal impact of town planning should not be neglected. Also planning has and have always a normative dimension. Town planning is forward-looking and a kind of vision for the future. City history and other planning history have to draw on plans and projects. Images play an important role because planning is a highly visual subject and that makes a difference for the disciplines. So this is not uh, my history. Uh, urban history and urban planning history should reflect not only planners' idea and the plan, but also a kind of a bottom-up perspective, how, when and where people suffer and have to bear plans and planners' decisions. That relates to the lecture we heard before. Urban historians can also profit from cooperation and application specific disciplines like city planning, urban sociology, urban geography, and city marketing. The importance of the past can be used for the present. Urban history offers, in a way, a promising meso level between micro what means local and macro global levels and perspectives on the other side. So uh, it's uh, very useful to take uh, this approach on the level of uh, cities and of urban areas um, and then to refer on one hand to individuals on the local level and on the other hand to global perspectives. Myth and symbols are central elements in the history of European cities. After a journey through over 60 European cities and a journey through the 20th century, the Dutch author Gerd Mark wrote, I quote, The weakness of Europe, its diversity, is also its great strength. And this finding might be helpful in defining and explaining the special characteristics such as the unique features of the historic European city and perspectives for our history and for planet history. Thank you for your